Cross. How's everybody doing? All right. Hey, I want to do something um, before we get into the message. If you work in any way, shape, or form um, with our children in uh, Manatee County School System, if you would stand up. I want to pray uh, a blessing over you, protection. This past week, I've, I've talked to several uh, people within our congregation. It's either parents or teachers, and, and there's just really fear going on with all these threats that's been happening this past week. As a church, we need to step up and we need to pray protection over our kids, protection over those that really minister to our kids, and we do not want to take them for granted. So let's just take a moment. I just want to pray for them. Pray for our police officer in back who lays his life on the line every single moment. I don't know if you guys know, but uh, there's been many deaths in the line of duty just within the last couple weeks of law enforcement officers across our country. So I want to encourage us as a church on a weekly basis, be pl praying for our first responders, be praying for our, our kids and our teachers. Let's just pray right now. Father, I thank you, God, for our teachers. Father, for those that are serving uh, our kids here and, and helping them um, uh, become educated and, and move forward with their life. We thank you, God, for our first responders in our community, and we do pray protection over them, Father. And Lord, we pray, Father, um, for uh, our, our school system here. We pray protection over them. God, I, I pray, Father, for those people that wish to do harm to our children. First off, we pray, Father, that they would repent and change their heart. But we also pray, God, if, if their heart is hardened, God, towards you, I pray, God, that their plans would be exposed. God, that the plans of the evil one would be exposed, Father. And, Lord, as a church, we stand in a gap for our, our, our kids, our teachers, all those that are helping uh, with our children, with first responders, and we pray a blessing upon them and their families this morning. And we pray this in the all-powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you so much. Well, as uh, the announcement uh, um, brought to your attention first Thursday, I just want to encourage you guys to come out to first Thursday. We have a very special guest this week. His name is Mark Dennison. He's a, he's a friend of mine. He actually lives in Sarasota. He's a church consultant, but he's also the former chaplain of the uh, Houston Rockets. He's a dynamic speaker. I've heard him speak before. So he'll actually be with us this uh, first Thursday. So I do want to encourage you guys to come out. You will uh, not be disappointed. It's always a very special time. Were well, you guys ready for a blonde joke? Yeah. Okay. A blind man enters a bar and finds his way to a bar stool after ordering a drink and sitting there for a while. The blind guy yells to the bartender, hey, you want to hear a blonde joke? And the bar immediately becomes absolutely quiet. In a husky, deep voice, the woman next to him says, before you tell that joke, you should know something. The bartender is blonde. The bouncer is blonde. I'm six foot tall, 200 pounds with a black belt in karate. What's more, the fellow sitting next to me is blonde, and he's a weightlifter. The woman to your right is blonde, and she's a pro wrestler. Think about it, mister. Do you really want to tell that joke here? The blind man thought for a moment and he says, you know what? I really don't think it's a good idea. I don't want to have to explain it five times. <laughs> so, all right. I knew you guys would like that one. All right. You know, I should have never read that article where it says that blonde, telling blonde jokes are politically incorrect because that just kind of fuels me on. My, my inner rebel comes out, you know. So... But, you know, um, as we mentioned earlier, today we're starting a brand new series called This Is What We Do. And, you know, in this series, we want to clarify as simply as possible of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And today I want to clarify any confusion um, when it comes to baptism. And, guys, the first thing, and, and hopefully I'll be able to convey this clearly today, very first step that we take after we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ is to be baptized. And again, my heart for this series is to, to really give you a clear understanding what it means to be a follower of Christ. And I want to look at uh, the words that Jesus found in Matthew 28, but I want to just kind of give you a little background leading up to the passage that we're going to read this morning. Jesus had been crucified, and he had been, been in a tomb for three days, and then he's been resurrected in power, 
and everybody's seeing him. And there's like hundreds and hundreds of people who have witnessed that he's alive and, and they've seen the, the scars in his hand. And, and so they're just kind of blown away. And so they're gathered around hearing him teach them. Now think about it if you were there, how that would impact your life. Because <clears throat> chances are it cleared people's thinking because no longer he's just a really good Bible teacher. No longer is he a, a good person with good moral lessons. No longer is he a prophet that, that does, uh, does some miracles. This is someone who is actually speaking with total authority. And how, you know, why do I say that? He said that he was going to die and he's going to come back from the grave three days later. And that's exactly what happened. Who does that except the Son of God? And his words have incredible weight. And in these weighty words, Jesus gives the church what's known today as the Great Commission. And it's one of the last things that Jesus says to, to his disciples before he ascends to heaven, before he goes before us to prepare a place for you and I in eternity. And he says this, these words in Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And Jesus, from that, that point of absolute authority, I want you to see that the notion of baptism originates with Jesus. It starts with Jesus saying to the church, go and baptize people. And, and just a, a few a few minutes later, he's getting ready to, to be taken up into the clouds, and he's ascending to, to heaven, and the disciples are watching. And the Bible talks about how as the, as the disciples are watching Jesus ascend, that you have angels that appear to the disciples and, and tell them, hey, go and begin doing what he said. And that's exactly what takes place with the disciples. But before they carry that mission out, fast forward to Acts 2, and the disciples are in a room known as the upper room. They're in the city of Jerusalem, and they're behind closed doors because the city of Jerusalem had just killed Jesus a few days earlier. So they're sitting there, and they're praying and waiting for the Holy Spirit, for the counselor that Jesus had promised would come. And you know what happens. The Holy Spirit shows up. And we'll read to you Acts 2, 2 through 4. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So all of a sudden, that, that lack of courage, that, that discouragement, that intimidation that caused them to, to be fearfully, you know, kind of lock, behind locked doors in the upper room, all of a sudden, that fear was replaced with a spirit of boldness. And the Bible tells us from that room that they spilled out, the disciples spilled out onto the cities of Jerusalem, on the city of Jerusalem, and began to tell people about the good news, about the life giving message of Jesus Christ. And something crazy, something amazing begins to happen because people begin to hear them talk about Jesus in their own language. And I don't know how many different languages and, and nationalities was walking around the city of Jerusalem that day. But to a person, every single one of them heard the good news of the gospel in their own language. That was a supernatural miracle. And the Bible tells us in Acts 2 that Peter gets up and he begins to tell people about the good news of Jesus. And, and most of the people in the crowd are, are uh, of the Jewish faith. And he opens up the word of God to them and says, hey, listen, I know you've been raised learning about the Messiah, that the Messiah is going to come. He said, I'm here to tell you that the Messiah has come and it's Jesus Christ. He came, he died, he rose again so that we might have life, so that he might establish his kingdom. And the Bible says, in that moment, people were cut to the heart. And verse 37 says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brother, what shall we do? And this is a great question. These pe people are wondering, okay, if Jesus is the real deal and we believe he's the real deal, what's our next step? What should we do? And that is a great question. That's a question that we should be asking in 2018. And here's Peter's response. 
Verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. And then watch what they do. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to, fe <clears throat> to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Let's just review for, for a moment. When it comes to following Jesus, we can see Jesus tells his followers, and this doesn't just apply to the audience in, in the book of Acts. This applies to you and I today. He says, go into all the world and tell them about me. And when they say yes to me, immediately you baptize them, and then you begin to teach them what I have taught you. And so these disciples do just that, and the Bible says 3,000 men, women, and children received the message, and they were baptized. And here's the first point. Baptism is public. It's a public display of an inner work that God has done in our life. It says in this passage that, that these men, women, and children, that they were cut to the heart. That means God did something in their heart. And, you know, the best example I can give you when I'm just talking about baptism, this example has been around for many years. Years ago, I fell in love with a girl by the name of Karen Brooks, and we chose to get married. I stood at an altar in front of God, family and friends, and I said I would love her for the rest of my life. And we exchanged vows. We exchanged red, wedding rings. So, so this ring conveys to the world that I'm, I'm taken, I'm spoken for. And the ring that she wears says, guys, if you mess with her, you die, okay? <laughs> I will tell you, when I was fighting cancer four years ago, I remember uh, having a really heart-to-heart -heart talk, serious talk from my wife one night. I said, babe, I just want to let you know, if I don't make it through this, okay, I want you to know, you have my blessing to get married. I want somebody to take care of you for the rest of your life. There's just one condition that if he starts putting the moves on you, I just want to let you know I'm going to ask Jesus for a hall pass so I can come back, okay? I'm going to go to this guy and say, today you're going to be with me in paradise, okay? Your soul is required of you today, so. But this wedding ring that I'm wearing is an outward symbol of an inward commitment that I've made to my wife, Karen. Baptism is an outward symbol. It's a public declaration of what God has done inside of each and every one of us, what he's done in our hearts. And true Christianity is lived out publicly. It always cracks me up when I see politicians running for office and somebody asks them an uncomfortable question about uh, Christianity or their faith, and they say, well, that's just really a private matter between me and God. BS meter goes off in my head, but anyway, <laughs> true Christianity, did I really say that just now? <laughs> but, true Christianity is lived out, this is why I try to stick to notes, okay? I get in trouble when I go off, but. True Christianity is lived out publicly. And I, I want to make sure that you get this. This is what Jesus says to his church, that you are to be a city on a hill, that you are to be a lamp on a stand that is not going to be hid. And the nature of light, the nature of a city on a hill, is for it to shine. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, it's not about us bringing attention to ourselves, but it's about us bringing attention to the one that saved us our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And baptism is his first step after salvation and is done in a public setting. As we continue to look at the book of Acts, you're going to see that the gospel begins to spread beyond Jerusalem and people began to take it back to their family and friends. Now people from all different backgrounds are coming in to a relationship with Jesus Christ. In Acts 8, we now see the gospel that's being spread to Samaritans through the teaching of, of Philip and other apostles. And the Samaritans, just maybe you don't know this, but the Samaritans were the outcast of Jesus' day. They were considered half-breeds, so they weren't fully Jewish, and they weren't fully anything else. So the religious leader, leader, the religious elite at that time, would give them a cold shoulder. They weren't feel welcome. They were, they were just like almost untouchable. 
But God made it very clear in Acts 8 that people who felt like they didn't measure up, people that felt like outcasts, that he wanted them to be a part of his family, that he was going to be, he didn't care what the religious leaders said, he wanted them to be a part of his family. So we read in Acts about Samaritans getting saved. But at the end of chapter 8, we read about a man who has zero connection with the Jewish faith. This man's from Ethiopia. The Bible tells us not only is he Ethiopian, but he's from a, a noble class, so he represented the royalty of Africa. He, rented, he uh, represented the royalty of Ethiopia, and he was coming to Jerusalem. Why? Because the Scripture tells us he was a God-fearer. And so here he is in Jerusalem, and he doesn't quite know where to go or what to do. And so somehow he gets his hands on the book of Isaiah, and he's actually reading it. He's sitting there reading it in his chariot. And he's reading the book of uh, Isaiah out loud when Philip walks by, and Philip heard the words that this Ethiopian is reading out loud. He's led by God to go over to him. So Philip goes over to him, and he asks him, do you know what you're reading? And the Ethiopian responded, well, how could I unless somebody explains it to me? With that, Philip sees a divine appointment here. So he sits down with this guy and begins to tell him how the, the Old Testament points to Jesus. And he talks about how Jesus came and he died and he rose again and we could have eternal life with him. And basically he leads this Ethiopian into uh, um, a re, uh, relationship with Jesus Christ. This Ethiopian gets saved. And look at what happened after the Ethiopian gets saved. It says this, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Here's number two. Baptism is a personal decision. Baptism isn't just a, a public declaration, but it's a personal decision. And the Ethiopian had to personally decide to say yes to Jesus Christ. He had to personally decide that, hey, you know what? There's some water over here. What's preventing me from being baptized? So he had to personally make the commitment to step into baptism. And I want to hear my heart here today. I'm not coming against any other denomination here this morning. But if you are raised in a tradition that... that uh, you're, you're baptized because your mom and dad simply wanted you to be baptized. You need to know that every example of baptism in the New Testament happened after somebody came into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Your parents may love you. Your grandparents may love you. They may have all the great motives, uh, the right motives. They want to introduce you to the church. They want to introduce you to Jesus but here's the deal. They can't decide for you and me if we're going to follow Jesus. And part of becoming a follower of Jesus Christ is to decide on your own that you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so every single person in the New Testament that said yes to Jesus begins to walk with him, and the first thing they do, they're, they're baptized. It's public and it's personal. And a lot of churches would baptize kids before they believe. I grew up in a church that, that they had um, infants um, baptized, and I was baptized as an infant, and I just know from the story it was a big, big deal for my parents. They had a big, uh, not only a big ceremony at church where uh, a couple in our church were identified as godparents, and, and they had a big celebration and all that. I'm sure it was very meaningful to my parents, but folks, I don't even remember it, okay? I wasn't even asked my opinion, okay? Uh, I couldn't even talk at that time, so that should have been an uh, indication we're moving a little too fast here, but um, do you follow what I'm saying? I didn't have a say in it, and at COTC, we do um, baby dedications. We recognize children as a gift from God, and, and we pray blessings over them and their family. As a church family, we come alongside them in, a, in that time of prayer, and we are committing as a church family that we will do everything in our power to help them raise that child in the things of God. And again, we're, we're talking about making a decision personally to follow Jesus and then follow it with baptism. 
Again, I just want to stress, it's not your grandparents' decision. It's not your parents' decision. It's not some other pastor's faith. It's your faith. And we each have to decide if we're going to follow Jesus personally before God. And as we continue to look about the early church, we'll see that the, the gospel continues to spread, but now persecution raises its ugly head. And in Acts 9, there was a man by the name of Saul that was going around terrorizing people that were following Jesus. And, and what would happen is the Jewish leaders would, at that time, would actually would write letters and commission a guy by the name of Saul and others to find these people that were worshiping Jesus to either throw them in jail and beat them or kill them. And so Stephen was actually stoned to death by these people simply because he believed that Jesus was the, the Messiah that the Old Testament talked about. And so he died being persecuted at the hands of these religious uh, fanatics. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story is because there's a very powerful testimony in uh, Acts 9. One of these men that were persecuting the Christians was a guy by the name of Saul. We will later read about him and know him as Paul. But he actually gets saved in Acts 9. And I love it. Catch this. God not only goes after the outcasts that feel like, man, uh, they're unworthy and, and, and they're treated by the religious leaders as, as an outcast or given a cold shoulder, and, and God gives them the message, I want to invite you to be a part of my family. Now what he does is he invites his very enemies to be a part of his family. Who does that? Well, God does that. So it says, on the day that Saul's getting ready, he's been given a new assignment, he's getting ready to hunt down some other Christians, a, a new church plant that's loving Jesus, and, and he's assigned to go find these men, women, and children, throw them into jail. And it says, on that road to find that new church plant or that new group of Christians, what, what happens? He has an encounter with Jesus. And the Bible tells us he's knocked off his horse. A light blinds him, and uh, suddenly he cries out, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord replies, It's me, the one you're persecuting. Why are you persecuting me? And I believe it is that that moment finally Saul connects the dots and realizes, you know what? The Christians I'm persecuting are really the good guys. They're not some cult. And that, that all of a sudden he begins to realize that he's persecuting God. And he's persecuting Jesus. And, and, and Jesus, God came down in the form of Jesus. He died, he rose again so that we might have life. And right there in that blindness, he begins to understand and follow God for the first time in his life. And the Bible tells us, at that moment in time, all the power, all the authority that Paul had was stripped from him. He is disoriented. He's blind. He's lacking clarity. He doesn't know which direction to even go. And he has to have one of his guys literally lead him into the town where he meets a disciple that prays over him and, and, and gives him some instruction. And that, that disciple, is by the name, his name is Ananias, and I want to read um, uh, Acts 9, 17, 19. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. Catch this, okay? He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And the, the Bible's telling us this enemy of God, right after he gives his heart to Christ, minutes afterwards, he rises up, and he's baptized. And here's point three. Baptism is our first step after salvation. It should be automatic. It should be a priority. Baptist. Baptism is public. It's a personal decision. And baptism is our very next step with our journey uh, with God. It's something that we should take very seriously because every example in the Bible takes it very seriously, points to the fact it's something very serious. And if you don't hear me say any, if you don't hear anything else I say, I want you to get this today. Baptism moves us from simply attending church 
and going to church to becoming the church. Do you follow what I'm saying? We're moving from attending church and just going to a service to becoming the church. And, and why do I say that? In the Old Testament, God was very clear that the people were to, to come to him, come to a building, come to the holy temple. But in the New Testament, all that changes because of Jesus. Jesus no longer wants us to, to come to a holy temple. He wants us to be the holy temple through Jesus Christ. He wants us to be a holy people.